that, look, I think trade is good. Uh, and I think actually we're probably one uh, of the more forward-thinking countries in the world because we've now uh, brought ODA, Overseas Development Aid and Trade, together. Uh, and I think that is an innovative step and hopefully, you know, whatever the combination uh, would take place after the election in relation to forming a government, I hope that those two sections remain together because I think it is vitally important and I think it's an area that Ireland can actually have a big say in. Um, and I think, you know, trade agreements are vital. Uh, they're vital for these developing countries to get access into premium markets in Europe. But no deal is better than a bad deal. And it's not the African countries that are saying that. It's our own farmers here in Ireland in relation to TTIP, which is another trade agreement that we're involved in. And where our own farmers are saying one thing and people on the ground, and the government ministers that are negotiating this and the European Commission are saying something completely different. Uh, both of them cannot be right uh, in relation to it. And the fruit of the pudding, uh, or the proof of the pudding is going to be in the eating in relation to TTIP. Now, there's no doubt about it, right across Europe, we have governance issues with governments uh, and parliaments. It's the same thing across Africa and across the developing world. And we're asking or believing that individual governments are going to fight for their own individual citizens uh, and get the best deal for them. Now, we're, we're putting a lot of reliance on that. And it reminds me of a negotiation that took place back in the early 1970s when our own government negotiated with the European DEC at the time uh, in relation to uh, an economic partnership. Uh, and we hung our fisheries industry out to, uh, to dry. And to this day, Parik McLaughlin and many of his peers on the Western Seaboard will say that that was a fundamental mistake that we made at the time. And when the French uh, Minister for Foreign Affairs or Trade or whoever it was brought it before the French Parliament at the time, and a French parliamentarian said, well, what about the fishermen uh, in Ireland? They'd been told, look, the Irish government are dealing with that, and we've seen the implications of it. So, to say that the individual governments are always going to be focused on the issues and the impacts that this has on the ground is not the case. We've seen our own government uh, in relation to the sugar industry here. Uh, we were told that the price of sugar was going to collapse. We're now calling it white gold. And again, this was going to be of benefit to the developing countries. We know the APC countries, through the Everything But Arms Agreement, have not got the preferential access. And they, along with our own farmers here in Ireland, have been the big losers in relation to it. And Minister, you know better than anyone uh, in relation uh, to that. The problem with the EPAs is they're far too focused on EU net exports rather than economic stability in these developing countries. Uh, and I made the point in, in the House uh, last week in relation to it that we have leaders across Europe wringing their hands about migration from, from Africa at the moment. Uh, and then at the same time, in tandem with that, they're pushing through these trade agreements that are loaded against local farmers and that the EPAs are leading to food insecurity in some of these countries, leading to conflict, uh, which is forcing people to migrate from some of these areas into Europe. And the EPAs are literally, in some cases, pouring fuel on the fire of, um, of migration. So I think we need to take that uh, into account when we're looking at these EPAs and when we're negotiating these EPAs, and that hasn't taken place uh, to date. In relation to the, African, uh, uh, the West African EPA, as you know, Minister, the Senegalese Minister of Commerce has specifically criticised the lack of effectiveness of the EPAs in relation to the safeguards uh, that are supposed to be written into them. We see at the moment, yes, poultry is not part uh, of this particular EPA, but yet uh, European legs and wings from chickens are literally being dumped uh, on, on the West African markets at the moment, completely undermining uh, the sector there and something that the sector will find it hard to recover from. So what do these farmers do? Uh, 
they have moved to the cities, uh, they cannot get jobs there in the cities, they see a better life uh, in Europe, they move to North Africa, they get on these dinghies and end up being drowned in the Mediterranean. That's the reality uh, of, of what can happen if they are badly uh, structured. I want Minister to, to turn to the, the Caribbean IPA because I think it's a good example because it's already been implemented. We're five years, seven years down the road uh, in relation to it now. So we can see, you know, have the EU delivered on their half of the bargain uh, in relation to these negotiations. Uh, one of the, the issues that is coming up now is these paratariffs. They're special levies that are, are not officially import duties, but they're a huge source of, source of revenue for these island communities. Up to 15% of government revenue in some of these countries are made up of these particular tariffs. Now, by the end of this year, those Caribbean countries will have to have Im eliminated these particular tariffs. Now, that's going to undermine uh, the economic stability uh, in some of these countries. Now, part of this agreement was the transfer of knowledge. And, you know, we've had the, um, the, uh, the EU Commission in here for the last number of years. Uh, love them or loathe them, but they have been providing advice and assistance to the Irish government and to the public service in relation to how to bring about reform. But that hasn't happened in these uh, Caribbean countries. It hasn't advised them on how they replace these paratariffs with something else. You know, have we as a country worked with some of these countries to explain the Irish experience in bringing foreign direct investment in, about using low corporation tax uh, as an incentive to drive economic development? You know, uh, and say that, look, there are other alternatives uh, out there. And my difficulty is that, you know, take Haiti, and I know uh, that Mary mentioned Haiti in her, in her own contribution earlier, and you're right, there are particular challenges uh, in relation to Haiti. But the EU has not been prepared to provide the type and scale of assistance that Haiti needs uh, to reform its structures. Now, that's the least developed country inside in the Caribbean uh, Agreement. So if we're not, uh, as a community, prepared to bend over backwards and to facilitate one of the poorest countries in the world, what hope have the four least developed countries uh, in the uh, East African uh, EPA got, or the 12 least developed countries uh, in the West African? Uh, EPA or the two poorest countries in the, the South African uh, EPA got. Uh, you know, the European Commission is saying one thing but failing to actually deliver on it in relation to these bilateral agreements with these particular communities. And it's undermining the EU's own policy which is a responsible EU trade policy. Uh, it's about introducing flexibility into these agreements, uh, particularly where there's economic issues at play, assisting these countries, but it isn't happening. And just to give you one final example uh, in relation to it, and that is in relation to the sanitary and phytosanitary provisions, which are standard across these uh, agreements. So it's all well and good to say that we are going to open up, open up trade uh, from these countries into Europe. Uh, we're going to reduce the tariffs for a certain amount of good or for all of a particular product. If we're putting up these other uh, trade barriers uh, in relation to uh, the sanitary and, and photosanitary provisions. Now look, as someone that is from the most rural constituency in the country, I know how important it is to have disease protections in place. I'm not talking about that. But take the, um, the Caribbean Agreement in relation to, particular example in relation to St. Vincent and Grenadines. Uh, agreement as part of it. One of the conditions of that was that the EU would actually build an airport so they could actually export goods from their islands into the European community. Uh, the investment that was promised was delayed and delayed and delayed. Eventually, hopefully by the end of this year, that airport will be opened. Now, if they were to go into the horticulture or in, in exporting flowers, which is a huge potential market for them into Europe, and particularly into the UK, where there is a lucrative market there in relation to it. They have to send 200 consignments a year for three years uh, into the European Union 
before they will uh, have a reduction in relation to their inspection charges. Those inspection charges over the next three years are 400 times the inspection charges of other established export countries uh, into the EU. So it's an effective barrier that's put in place. Now, if for some reason they don't get 200 consignments next year, because the airport is only opening hopefully uh, next month, uh, and they don't get the 200 consignments, that kicks that agreement another year down the road. So it'll be four years before uh, they can get uh, the approval of reduced inspection fees. And those increased inspection fees are a further tariff on them to actually export uh, into the European community. Now, our own farmers have been very critical here about not the EU rules, but how they're interpreted and implemented. And this, I think, is a problem with the EPAs. Is it's not the EPAs themselves, but it's how they're being interpreted and implemented on the ground that's creating additional barriers. And that is the problem uh, in relation to it. And that is the frustrating thing that we're finding from talking to the NGOs, to talking to organisations that are working with communities on the ground. Thank you, Chairman.